Hey Tony, it's Saturday, but I already told you why I wasn't able to do it yesterday. Um, yesterday was a really long day. I, By the time I got home, I had to immediately go to the next thing. And by the time that thing ended, it was midnight. So there was no chance I was going to be able to do a video. Um, so to answer your question of the week, it's that's kind of a big question because there are a lot of words that have changed. But two that initially came to mind for myself and Justice when we were talking about it were the words gay and queer. Gay used to essentially mean happy, whereas queer was just odd, different. And now they've turned into more... They're not slurs, but they've, they've turned into phrases to represent people in the LGBT community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's that, those are two words that have definitely changed. That's really only been changed in the past even 50 years, really. And language changes so much, especially, like, the way the internet works today. Words change so quickly. Phrases change so quickly. It's hard to keep up. <laughs> like, there are certain... And there are words that didn't exist beforehand, or if they did exist, they had a completely different meaning. Like, meme comes to mind. A meme before was just, like, something that you see frequently, whereas now it's memes. Memes, memes everywhere Jesus Christ. sorry i was hoping someone would laugh please laugh no sorry i'm kind of busy dealing with king boo that's fine Times three. um so what i want to talk about this week tony is something i'm going to call the sins of 2008 so there was a really good video i watched earlier in the week by uh, cody from alternate history hub <laughs> now alternate history hub is a really great channel and i really recommend it because it it's a great look at history, plus let's change one minor thing and let's look at the butterfly effect on how everything else changes. Uh, one video that I definitely recommend that you should de you should really watch would be his Napoleon video, because that is huge. Like, if Napoleon never existed, so much of the modern world wouldn't exist. So I recommend that video. But the video that he did that I watched the, uh, the other day was a look back at the 2010s and to look back at like what was really a weird decade was the way that Cody put it up. And I actually want to look back even a little bit beforehand, and I want to look to 2008. The reason why I want to look to 2008 is because a lot of what we see today involved in the political sphere relates back directly to, like I said, as I call it, the sins of 2008 to 2010. So 2008, Barack Obama was elected president, the first African-American president person to ever be, to be president of the United States. It was a huge moment. He had a campaign that was like incredible with his hope you can believe, uh, change you can believe in, hope, etc., etc. Like these are all parts of political history now that we will be talking about, I think, for a long time. Like those slogans along with make America great again, I think are two two um political slogans that we're going to remember for decades because of what they represented in the times we live in now we live in very complicated times we are complicated people living in complicated times and a lot of what you can see relates to again 2008 to 2010 2008 it was a huge sweep for the democrats and the republicans basically put it on themselves to try and make obama a one-term president and that's what we've like we had seen a lot of political in a lot of political fighting, a lot of uh, polarization beforehand. But in two thousand eight, that was when it became an official policy of obstructionism, and it actually paid dividends for the Republicans in two thousand and ten. Now much can be said for the Democrats on their inability to to prosecute their election, the election of two thousand ten. Because they lost so many governor seats, they lost the House, they lost the Senate. And all of these had major ramifications for the next 12, for the next 10 years, as we're in 2020 right now. The reason why 2010 was so, was such a catastrophic loss for the Democrats is predominantly because they lost all the governorships. The reason why I say that that's important is because the governors post, post census establish redistricting and much can be said on gerrymandering on how it's an absolutely terrible undemocratic process because it 
it's just, it's absurd. It's obscene. And it has real political consequences for whoever didn't win. Now I'm, I'm all for agreeing that elections have consequences because they should. But one consequence shouldn't be the ability for others to vote. And these governorships were such a were such a loss because it set up just absurd congressional districts to be able to put like for example, let's let's look at the city of Springfield compared to some of our surrounding some of our surrounding neighbor, um, cities. Springfield is a densely is a densely populated urban center. Whereas if you go to, say, Agawam, it's not as much. Or Westfield, it's definitely not as much. Or even into the hill towns, which are really rural. And you can look at the way the districts were set up. Now, Mass didn't have as huge of an issue as some, some other places did. Like, Ohio had major issues with, with, sal- with gerrymandering. Because you had your, very, you had your blue urban districts that had an excess of population. And then you also had your rural areas. And by adjusting, adjusting everything by adjusting the, the boundaries, you marginalize entire groups of people on based on political, based on political views. And that was a major loss. Now, a large part of that is because the Democrats were unable to follow up with a once in a lifetime political talent, like, president obama with anyone now obama was never was not really one to campaign with democrats he was more into governing rather than campaigning which also didn't help because it it inherently made the democrats position weaker because their strongest voice was not really a factor in a lot in a lot of the campaigns for some of your contested contested elections and we're starting to see more of this now, in which the Democrats have never been great at finding talented young individuals to foster, to foster their talent and continue the, the survival of the party. I, mean, I think in you and I's life, there are only a handful of young political activists who the Democrats really used and really fostered their talents. One of them was President Obama. But you look today... Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is also a, 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 an excellent political talent, someone who has really, really inspired a lot of people, particularly in, in her congressional district. But the Democrats aren't really trying to foster that. Instead, there's been a lot of infighting between AOC and Speaker Pelosi. And that is just a way to alienate the, the entire youth, alienate your next generation. We see it in Massachusetts right now. Now, as you may or may not know, Tony, I'm working on Joe Kennedy, Joe Kennedy's Senate campaign, and he's going against Ed Markey, who is the incumbent who's been, he's been in politics for 40 years. He's only been the mass senator for, I think, six. This is, this would be his second term if he wins. But Joe Kennedy is a young generational talent. He has, he has, he has the name to really get people interested. Like I was talking with um, a colleague of mine who is also very politically minded, and we were talking about how people who are only tangentially interested in politics are interested in the Senate race because of Joe Kennedy. And we, the debate was on Tuesday and there was a lot of back and forth between Joe Kennedy and Senator Markey. And one thing that kept popping up is that Senator Markey and many of the other establishment politicians are not interested in fostering people like Joe Kennedy, people like AOC, generational talents, because it will hurt their own position. And that's just, that's a terrible process. And it's why there's a real lack of millennial involvement in politics. We have been alienated so much by particularly the Democratic Party. And that's something that you can't say as much about the Republicans. Now, Republicans have their own issues of not fostering young talent, but they are... They have always been good at picking talented individuals and at least mentoring them. They've taken young individuals like Paul Ryan was a fairly young congressman when he was really taken under the wing of the GOP establishment and he became one of the most powerful politicians in Washington during his time. So it's interesting and things we have to look at. Tony, my question for you is, do you hope for more youth in politics? I'll see you on Friday.